Stand with us today. We'll begin worship. You came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing. We're alive. Cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love Shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger.
When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Father, thank you for the overwhelming love of Christ that was demonstrated by his death for us to pay for our sins and by his resurrection from the dead to defeat death on our behalf. Father, we've gathered together this morning to worship you for everything that you've done for us in Christ. God, direct our hearts to Christ this morning. Whatever's happened to us this week, whether good or for bad, we pray, God, that you would help us to Lift our eyes, lift our hearts, lift our minds to think about your goodness, your glory, your grace to us. And we pray that you would receive the worship from us that you deserve. Unite our hearts together by the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in church. Friends, welcome this morning to Green Ridge Baptist Church. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here. Here at Green Ridge, we... Uh, our exiles, exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. That's who we want to be as God's people. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. If you uh, got one of these handouts and you came in this morning, I invite you to get it out, open it up, look at it, see what's going on in there. If you're new with us, 
maybe first or second time, there's a little blue QR code that looks like this. You can use the camera on your phone to scan that and give us a little bit of information about you. Just, I think, name and email, and then uh, it kind of starts a, conversations, a conversation between you and us at this church. Um, this week, you'll receive an email from probably Pastor Mark, and uh, we can learn more about who you are and uh, how we can love you as a church. Um, there are a couple things going on uh, in the next couple weeks or so. Next Sunday, members, we have a business meeting at 1040 in this room between services. We are also likely to have an, a, a kind of a tacked on additional time for that business meeting later in the day next Sunday over Zoom. Because I think there's going to be a lot of things that you all want to talk about, which is great. Uh, so that's next Sunday. Um, the Friday after that is a women's ministry evening bonfire. So ladies, please sign up for that. It'll be a good time of fellowship and fun. Um, the Saturday after that, on the 8th, uh, is a men's ministry bros and brunch. Come and the food will be awesome, men. Uh, fellowship will be good as well. There's a couple volunteer opportunities for the church. The first one is uh, Summer Sundays. This is uh, a time during the summer where we let our normal, regular uh, Sunday school teachers and the children's ministry have kind of a break for several weeks, uh, but we need to fill their spots. So if you are willing and able, please consider signing up for summer Sundays to help in children's ministry over the summer, even if it's just one or two Sundays. It doesn't have to be a huge, long commitment, but if you can, please uh, sign up for that. And then Vacation Bible School volunteers, Vacation Bible School is coming up. There's a ton of kids that are going to be in this building hearing about Jesus, and we need adult volunteers to help make that happen. So please, uh, please do that. Uh, you may notice that Pastor Mark has a weird hairstyle today. That's because, wow, it's getting applause. Wow. That's because on Wednesday, the whole church learned that he was the worst at baseball. And uh, so that's why he has to wear that. And you wanted me to announce one other thing. I forgot what it was already. Nope, that wasn't it. Doesn't matter. Hey, uh, Wednesdays, uh, normal Wednesday night programming is over um, for the summertime. There is one more Smart Sacks meeting this Wednesday, so uh, come and help with that if you usually do. Um, but we are going to continue uh, having something on Wednesday night, if you're around, if you're available. Um, from 6 to about 6.45, uh, we're going to gather in the sanctuary and have a time of prayer and worship. So um, please come to that. If you if you want something to keep doing during the summer uh, on Wednesday nights, that'll be there. Um, and we'll pray together and sing some, and it'll be a good time. Did you remember? Oh, we're starting a new sermon series next week. That was it. Uh, it's a new sermon series through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, and it's called The Summer of Our Discontent. Mark came up with that name, which is great. That's kind of a collective groan more than anything else. Good. Uh, hey, friends, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And so part of our opening prayer time this morning, uh, we do want to pray for the safety of our U.S. military personnel and for military families that have lost loved ones in the line of duty. After that, one of our elders is going to come and lead us in the Lord's Prayer. So please stand with me. Let me pray for us. And then one of our elders will come and lead us in the Lord's Prayer. We'll continue to worship. Pray with me. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to gather this morning with your people for a time of worship. And we humbly ask that you would move with power among us today. Father, we pray that you would knock down the strongholds of sin in our lives. Destroy our pride and our lust and our laziness with the wrecking ball of your word today. And build in our hearts humility and purity and purpose in the name of Jesus. Fill us with power and conviction by your Holy Spirit. Show us the next steps of faith that you would have us take. We ask that you would save souls today. That someone who is on the fence about following you would be nudged by your Holy Spirit today to give you their life completely and be rescued from sin. We also pray for rededication today. Lord, some of us, maybe one of us specifically, we're wayward and wandering from the faith today. Father, draw that person back to you today. Draw them back to a life committed and devoted to you. And finally, Father, we want to pray for the safety of U.S. military personnel. Protect them. 
Provide for their needs. Give them your grace and shield them from harm. We pray for their salvation, that they would find their ultimate safety in Christ, who would shield them from wrath and hell by the work that he did for them on the cross. We also pray for military families who've lost loved ones in the line of duty. Bring them comfort in their homes today and this week as they mourn mothers and fathers lost, brothers and sisters lost, sons and daughters lost. Bring peace to their hearts and minds, and may they find hope in you, O God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time, one of our elders is going to come lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Good morning, church. Still in the attitude of prayer, uh, please let's stretch out our hands as we pray the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us. Please feel free to um, say the prayer in any language or translation or version in which you have learned it. I will read from the script. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Wandering restless lives Spending our days in darkest night Needing a rescue Wondering how we would survive The humble Christ came down Pushed back the darkness all around. Our sins were forgiven. And we were made new. Now all of our souls and hearts, all of our minds in every part, all our devotion, all our commitment from the start. And all of our songs of praise, all of the worship we can raise, all of the glory and all of the honor all our days, you deserve. Reviving our tired souls, Jesus sustains us through it all, helping us walk on that beautiful, blessed, narrow road. The grace of Christ now stands as our only sure foundation. He's our only rescue. He's our only hope and all of our souls and hearts. All of our minds in every part. All our devotion, all our commitment from the
Then one day we'll see our King. We'll speak face to face and we will sing of all of the wonders that we have seen. And all of our souls and hearts, all of our minds in every part, all our devotion, all our commitment from the start. And all of our songs of praise, all of the worship, Church, receive this blessing from the Lord today. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Sing that again. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is 
with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming, and you're going, and you're weeping, and rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. deserves all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. And Father, as we move into this time of special music where we sing about just some of the things that you are, may we worship and think about the words of these song, of this song, Lord God. May we worship you for all of the things that you are for us. Lord, a million affirmations wouldn't be enough of praise and honor and glory that you deserve. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said together, amen. You may be seated.
KPW kids, you're dismissed. Have a great KPW time. Uh, if you're new with us and you've got elementary age kids, uh, right now they're going down to KPW, which is Kids Praise and Worship. If you don't know what in the world that is or you're kind of nervous about that, you can go down and introduce yourself to a volunteer and just see what's happening. Uh, I'm going to pray right now for our kids. I'm going to pray for any offering that's taken up today. I'm going to pray for Pastor Mark as he brings the message. So pray with me, church. Father, we are thankful for our children, and it is not lost on us the responsibility of rearing them in the Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us with that. Help us with this responsibility. Help us to, to deposit in them the raw materials of faith the raw materials of Christianity. And Father, we pray that you would forge it into a lifelong faith, forge it into a walk with Jesus. God, we pray for uh, the children's ministry workers right now. Thank you for their faithful service. We pray, God, that you would empower them today to clearly communicate the word of God to our kids. Help them to communicate the gospel clearly. Help them to have patience and grace and mercy and understanding as they love on our children. We pray, Father, for any offering that's taken up today. God, we recognize that it's your money, and uh, we, we want to do with it what you want us to. And so we pray that you would bless it as it grows the kingdom of God, and we pray that you would give us wisdom in how to steward it well. I pray for our own individual hearts that you would continue to shepherd us down the path of, of godliness by, through the spiritual discipline of, of tithing. Father, use tithing to to train our hearts away from greed and toward dependence on you and devotion to you. And finally, Father, I pray for the message today. I pray that you would give Mark uh, power to declare the word of God boldly and truthfully. I pray that you would use him to speak truth into our hearts and minds today. And Father, from this message, I pray that you would convict us of the truth of the gospel, convict us of our sins, compel us to faith and obedience, comfort us in our pain, and care for us in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So I've gotten some, I'll tell you the top three comments that I've gotten. One, uh, I should be in an 80s hair band. Uh, 
so my preference, by the way, would be Stan Bush because of his hit You've Got to Touch, which was featured in the 1984 animated Transformers movie, one of the best films of all time. Uh, second top comment I've gotten is that uh, people finally can see that I look Italian. I've got my, my mom's side of the family is 100% Italian. My father's side is like 50%. So I'm, I'm fairly Italian, even though I may not look it. Um, and the third comment, oh, I lost it. It's, no, that wasn't the top third. No, there was another comment. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Um, I don't mind mocking myself. I, I do kind of mind mocking the preaching. So I'm going to take it off while I preach, if that's okay with you. All right. Um, how's my hair? All right. Church, we are, we are wrapping up our series in 1 Thessalonians today. So go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I have never myself worked in a cubicle. Raise your hand if you've worked in a cubicle. Yeah? Um, cubicles were, I guess, uh, sort of a cliche image of work during, what, the 90s? Did they arrive in the 80s with hairband? I think it was more 90s, right? Um, there was, there was a movie called Office Space that I saw when I was younger, and I, it is not an appropriate movie. I don't know who let me watch it as a teenager, but my mom's over here. Anyway, um, <laughs> but the, the plot of the movie was sort of the joke that cubicles suck the life out of you, right? It's, it's not a wonderful, warm uh, work environment. You show up to your impersonal prison cell every day. You make your license plates, and uh, the life is drained from you, and you go home, and you rinse and repeat. And I'm not sure when the shared uh, communal workspace thing first got popular, but somewhere around the 2010s, I think Google and other companies were setting a new trend with uh, coworkers milling about and talking to each other and working collaboratively and even having coffee and smoothies while working and chit-chatting. And there became like a way to make fun of that, right? The cliche way to make fun of that is like, nobody's doing any work and everybody's just playing board games all day and you do like 30 minutes of work. But, but uh, companies began to kind of shift a little bit and who knows if it's best for productivity or not. I'm sure books have been written on that. But the idea, the idea was that allowing people to have a workspace where they have relationships with their coworkers and their bosses, that would energize people. And it would make them excited to go to work because they weren't arriving to their prison cell, but they were, they were reconnecting with their team and achieving the company mission together, right? That's sort of the idea. Today, as we wrap up in our series in 1 Thessalonians, um, the Apostle Paul, remember, he's writing to a group of very new believers, and the major theme that we've seen in this letter is that since their faith is so new and things are becoming difficult, the lingering question is, will their faith last? Their faith is being persecuted, so will it endure? And over the past few weeks, we've been learning about what does it take to have a faith that lasts, right? We've seen a whole bunch of examples of things that we need to do if we want our faith to last. We need the Word of God as a sure foundation for our faith. Um, we need to apply our faith so it's not just thoughts up here, but it's coming out in our day-to-day -day lives. Otherwise, it will just fizzle out in the realm of ideas. Today, as we close out the letter and the series, Paul is going to give a flurry of commands. It's just boom, boom, do this, do this, do this, do this. And most of these commands, you're going to see, they're related to each other in that they are connected to the way that we handle our relationships in the church. And I think it's because the Apostle Paul knows that what Google and other companies were discovering in the 2000s, that when we try to do this faith thing alone, we are cubicle Christians who end up depressed and suffocated and lose the will to go on. Faith is not a solo sport. We're not meant to do this thing alone. But when we have Christian brothers and sisters who we can cooperate with on a team, heading in the same direction together, that's invigorating when we do this following Jesus thing together with brothers and sisters in Christ. And so today, the big idea is this. I'll give it to you before we even hop into the text. It's a faith that lasts commits to church community. A faith that lasts commits to church community. So how, how do we commit to church community? 
Um, I think we're going to find three ways as we go throughout this. So let's take a look at verses 12 through 13. And, and the first way that we're going to see, so, so when you hear this, start, start processing it as we read. Do you see it there? A faith that lasts commits to church community by honoring church leaders. So let's read the text together. Verse 12, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Let's stop there for a bit. So, um, hey, Pastor Mark is telling you to listen to Pastor Mark. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) On the day that he humiliates himself with a crazy wig, he's saying, respect me, you know? Uh, Two quick thoughts. First, put me aside for a moment. Forget about me. And look at what the Word of God is saying. Because I'm not saying this. The Word of God is saying this. I'm not the authority. The Word of God is the authority. And second, I'm, I'm not the only leader here. And this may not even be the only church you ever belong to. Some of you will move and some of you will find other churches. And, and I'm urging you to, to hear this for the sake of that church community as well and those leaders. Um, this church is led by a group of pastors and elders and um, we are all accountable to one another. In fact, I'm, I'm probably more accountable to the elders than anyone else in the church because the elders are really watching my life <laughs> in a way that they're probably not uh, honing in on you. And so there's accountability for all of us. So let's unpack what these verses mean. What does it mean? Uh, we're told to respect church leaders. Respect is this idea of admiring deeply, right? And it's not as strong a word as obey. I really don't think the Bible is telling you, you must obey in all things, um, the church leaders, but it's here telling us to at least respect. And I think that at least that carries with it a willingness to listen to the advice and counsel of church leaders, to hear them out. When they've got something to say, you give them time and you ponder what they say. You give it weight. You don't just dismiss if you disagree. You really wrestle with them prayerfully. And the Apostle Paul gives two quick reasons that we should respect our church leaders. He, said they, he says they're working hard, right? They are doing good things for the church. They are making effort. Give them some respect for that. But second, they have a position of authority from the Lord, he says, We don't just respect them for who they are, but for the role that God has given them. And so if elders come to me and say, Mark, we need to talk to you about something, I need to respect what they would have to say to me as as much as I would respect what the Lord would say. I have to give it value and time and listen and, and really see what they have to say. And notice we're told to respect them as they what? As they admonish us. Do you know what that word means? That's, we don't use that word, like hardly ever. Um, admonish means to offer a strong correction. So this is not a call to respect church leaders when everything is honky-dory. It's specifically talking about when there are disagreements, when the leaders in the church are calling you out for something, strongly correcting you, will you respect them then? That's what the Word of God is is calling you to do. And so let's get practical. When a pastor overheard you talking to someone here at church and comes up and says, you were being rude and you need to go apologize. Are we going to play the game of, well, pastor needs to mind his business. Pastor doesn't know the whole story because what that person said to me five minutes earlier, or will we take it to heart? Will we make an effort to respect what church leaders are saying. Paul doubles down on this. He says it again by telling us to esteem them highly in love. Esteem is just a synonym for respect. It means to to admire uh, adoringly, right? And he adds here in this, highly in love. Who do you respect highly in love? Who would you go the extra mile for with a smile on your face? Is it grandma? Is it, is it someone who's been closer than a brother or sister throughout your life, who's been with you through thick and thin? Who do you admire and esteem highly in love? The Bible is calling on us to treat church leaders that way. 
coming from Pastor Mark, I know, but coming from the Word of God, what do you do with that? When it comes to conflicts in the church or correcting sin in one another's lives, what is the goal of that? Why would church leaders get involved and admonish you? Why do they care? Why not let you live the way you want to live? What's the mission behind church leaders getting involved? I think it's a couple of things. It's to resolve conflict in the body and to, to re- bring about repentance of sin so that the unity of the church can be preserved so that our witness can stay intact, and so that our God can be glorified, and so that the mission of the church and the kingdom can still be advanced. If you're a parent or have spent time responsible for children, maybe a teacher, or you do daycare or something, I think, I think that you get that you don't really care about the details all the time, and you don't, you don't really want to wade into all of the drama as as a father, I hear my daughters constantly bickering and arguing about stuff. And church, it is usually stuff I roll my eyes over, and I just don't care. I don't care to get involved. Like, where they sit at the dinner table. I always sit here. Yeah, but I got here first. Oh my gosh, this doesn't matter at all. This doesn't matter. Or another one that they, uh, they argue about, it's just bizarre, is... I'll come in, and it's like, why are you guys fighting? She looked at me, and I didn't tell her she could. What? What is this nonsense, right? It would be more entertaining to me to go clip my fingernails than try to mediate what's going on here. Most of the time, actually, I don't get super involved quickly, most of the time, because I want my daughters to figure this out they got to figure out how to handle their own drama. they got to figure out how to, when, when one person bugs the other, they have to figure it out amongst themselves. But I do sometimes get involved. And it's not when I actually care about the argument. It's when I can tell that they are not resolving it in a helpful, kind, loving, Christ-like way. I will step in because I want to coach them on how to love each other, so they don't escalate the bitterness into whirlwinds of drama that ruin their mother's day. There is a point where it needs to be coached so the whole family can have peace and the two of them can grow in love. Amen? And friends, when the leaders of the church think it's time to get involved in your drama, I can almost guarantee you that it is not because we enjoy it, okay? I will be honest, the times I've had to have tough conversations with people here at Green Ridge, I dread them. Like, like for days leading up to when I talk to people, I have a pit in my stomach. I'm not excited about it. I'm not thrilled to be, yeah, let me put myself in all this drama. I just, oh my gosh, I dread talking to people about uncomfortable things. So why do we get involved? The goal of this work is the unity of the body of Christ to preserve our love for one another, to maintain the cooperation of this fellowship so that this whole family of God can be healthy, so we can be about the mission of Jesus together and not fractured, so we can love being here and not let this gathering become a place of resentment and drama. I hate going to my cubicle. No, we want this to be a family that gathers and wonderful. So if we want a faith that lasts, It will mean committing to church community, and part of that commitment means giving proper respect to those whose task it is to lead the church and guard its unity. What does this look like, practically? It doesn't mean you need to, you know, when Pastor Mark speaks, you need to say, yes, sir, I'll jump, how high, right? It's not not blind obedience. That's not what we're asking for. If any of us leaders in the church start behaving like we're barking orders and you just need to get in line, ugh, Talk to, the, talk to other elders who still have some sense in them to rebuke those pastors and leaders. But here's what it does mean. It means being careful not to lower other people's respect for church leaders. And so when you're frustrated with church leaders, don't voice that and vent that as a complaint to everybody, but go talk to those church leaders. If I do something that bugs you or you're not sure what I meant by that, don't hash that out with seven people here and, and get them to kind of think poorly of me, come talk to me. Come talk to me. Give me at least a chance to explain 
my thoughts or, or why I made a decision I made, or even apologize, right? We could resolve it right there. There is a time if you think that a church leader, pastor, elder has sinned against you, you go to them, they're not listening, there is a time to go talk to another pastor and elder and bring them in. And if they're still not listening, we go to the rest of the elders. And if they're still not listening, oh boy, God bless the church in handling that kerfuffle. That'll be difficult, but it, it needs to be handled that way. But it, I think this also means responding humbly when church leaders try to call you out. Will you be open and humble and come to the table and try to work it out? Or will you dig your feet in and assume your side of the story is right and you don't need any advice from anybody? For the sake of Jesus and the good of his church, we all need to humble ourselves to one another, myself included. Paul continues with a flurry of commands that begin to move more toward the way we treat one another and not so much looking to the way we respond to church leaders. So we're going to look at those asking again this question, how do we commit to church community? And we're, we're going to find our second answer is by loving our church siblings. A faith that lasts commits to church community by loving church siblings. Look at verses, uh, middle of verse 13 to 15. It says, Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. This second set of commands is turning our attention from the way we respect leaders in the church to the way we treat one another in general. And the way that the Bible uh, tends to couch this, the, the church community language in the Bible is very often family language. And the Apostle Paul here calls them brothers, right? And that's what we are in the family of God. God is our Father and we are brothers and sisters in Christ and so we see this family unity on display later. Look down at verse 26 really quick. I, I don't have it on the screen, but verse 26 says, Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. And you're like, we're doing what with who now? That's weird. Could you imagine if that was the application of today's sermon? Like at the end, instead of an altar call, at the end I said, all right, we're going to line up like the end of a baseball game. Uh, some of you over here, some of you over here, we're just going to cross each other in a line and we're going to good game. Mwah, 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 greet each other with a holy kiss. That would be weird, especially post-COVID, right? That's strange. I actually, I grew up in a big fat Italian family. And it was normal, at especially uh, holidays, you would gather together and you'd kiss everybody. And as a, like an eight-year-old boy, a 12-year-old boy, and my aunts, are, they've got lipstick on, and they're like, come here, Mark, and some of them, why are your lips so wet? Why are you puckering up before this? It's just... But that was the way our family showed family affection, and maybe some of you can relate. The point is not, you know, you got to smooch everybody on your way into church. The point is this, at church, we should have a family level of affection for one another. Do you hug in your family? We should hug in this church. Do you, do you smile big and catch up with family? We should smile big and catch up in this church. That's the kind of affection we should have for each other. And look at verse 13, so we're going back now to verse 13. He tells us to maintain peace with one another. We are a people who need to be quick to overlook wrongs from our brothers and sisters in the church. We need to be quick to apologize to our brothers and sisters in church. We need to be quick to make things right when we wrong one another. We, when there is conflict, our desire should not be, how do I get them? Our desire should be, how do I maintain peace? How do we strive for peace and unity? Verse 14 gives a bunch of commands for similar but different situations. We're encouraged to identify what each person needs and then give them what they need. Do we have a lazy brother or sister? Admonish them with a strong correction. Do we have someone who is ready to give up? Encourage them with joy and love. Do we have someone who is weak and struggling? Help them. Get in there with them and make a difference. And all of these, all of these, we're told, 
to do even the serious ones, even the big moments of correction, we're told to do them with patience, understanding, compassion, right? Why? Because we're family, church. We're not giving up on each other. We're here to help, and we're in this together. And it will not always be easy to tell who is who, right? Did you, did you connect the dots that, that those three kinds of people might present the same way the first time you meet them? It is not always easy to tell which person is struggling in life because they're lazy and which person has tried with all their might and and been beat up by life and so they're just discouraged and they feel like there's no point anymore and which person is is trying and they just don't have it in them right now and they need some support and help. It's hard to tell who's who. How do you figure it out? Part of it is patience. We give them patience. We get to know them. We love them. We don't jump to conclusions. When as we identify what people need, we start to give what they need. And sometimes it's a correction, but other times it's support. Verse 15, we're told how to treat each other when we're wronged. See, because we're family, not enemies, we do not go to war and escalate. Instead, we respond with goodness. We don't repay anyone evil with evil. They treat you badly, you don't do the same. You respond with goodness to anyone and everyone. When someone here at the church offends you with a comment, do not return a passive-aggressive volley. You extend an olive branch with kind words because the goal is that we would find a way to have peace together as family here for a long, long time. We're not trying to win battles. We're trying to preserve unity and honor the Lord with love. Um, my wife and I both come from big, fat families. Um, over the years, my, my grandparents passed away. And when they did, they were sort of the glue that held the family together. And uh, family gatherings became fewer and more rare. Um, and also the grudges that come up in families just were held on to. And, and uh, it just isn't the way it once was. My wife's family, on the other hand, when her grandmother passed away, she was the glue, um, the three daughters rose to the occasion and have, have held things together. And we continue to gather, and there's something like 20 great-grandchildren in, in our family gatherings. Easter is just bananas. We had 5,000 eggs here at the church or something like that. We had 80,000 eggs for the family. I'm kidding, but it's a big deal. It's a lot of us. And one of the things that's happening behind the scenes is my mother-in-law will call and she'll say, hey, are you coming on the family trip? Great, uh, so-and-so's family is coming. You know, it's a little tough when you bring your dog because he's big and he knocks the toddler down. Do you mind not bringing the dog, right? My mother-in-law is negotiating terms and peace and she's getting in there to try and make sure this thing doesn't explode over the weekend. It takes work. It takes work is my point. If we want a faith that lasts, we need to commit to church community, and that commitment means committing to a family level of effort and work and love and unity and forgiveness, and that will be hard. That will be hard, but it's worth it, and it's good. It's what we're called to. We have to strive for peace because we can't, we can't be a church full of people who are burning bridges with each other and escalating drama, and it becomes this point where, where we need help on Wednesday night in the kitchen, but so-and-so is already helping, so we know those two people can't come help because they've had a feud that's been going on for three years. What a mess. What a mess. That's not the way the people of God ought to behave. So let's be better than that, amen? The Apostle Paul turns his focus upward in the last few verses How do we commit to church community? A faith that lasts commits to church community by seeking the Lord for the church. We seek the Lord for the church. Verses 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We need to seek the Lord in all of this. We're told to seek him in prayer and in praise. And Paul emphasizes that we should be constantly talking to God and seeking him. And so we should seek him together as a church family for the good of the church. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Again, we're seeking the Lord 
And as we seek him, we are looking for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We do not ignore him or quench him, but we're open to his leading. And so church, we really do believe that God wants to guide us and lead us. And when we don't know which way to turn, we pray for wisdom. We should expect the Spirit of God to guide us and answer us. But we also need to be realistic because not every hunch or gut feeling someone has truly is from the Lord. So we can't take every claim when someone says, I have a word from the Lord. We don't take every claim as if it's gospel. We test it is what Paul says to do. We test it by the word of God. We test it with wisdom from the elders of the church. And so we're seeking God for wisdom and we're open to his leading, but we're not blindly believing just any claim. Verses 22 through 24 say, Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Sanctify, make you holy, right? You're, you're leaving behind evil and you're living in holiness. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. We're told to reject evil and to be holy. And Paul is actually praying here that God would make the people holy. And then he says we should be encouraged because God is faithful to do that. God is at work in us to help us leave behind sin and pursue his holiness. And if he's faithful to do that work, church, the Lord doesn't give up on projects. The Lord doesn't quit halfway through. The Lord will never give up on you. And so if he has begun a good work in you in Christ, he is going to see it to completion. Take encouragement in that when you are in a rough spot in life. Know that God hasn't given up on you. He's not abandoning you. And get back up. Seek the Lord for help, like Paul is praying, that God would help sanctify us. Seek the Lord that he would do these things and trust him to do it. And then in verse 25, he says, brothers, pray for us. Again, seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the Lord, and pray for the leaders in the church even. If we want our faith to last, we need to commit to church community, and part of that commitment is a commitment to seek the Lord for the church. We have a part to play, right? The sower tosses out the seed, the farmer plows and tills, maybe even waters, but who brings the growth, church? It's the Lord, and so we need to seek him that he would do those good things in us. One cool opportunity to do this Pastor Paul mentioned Wednesday nights over the summer from 6 to 6.45, we are going to gather for prayer. Anyone who can make it, there's no dinner, there's no children's ministry, no youth ministry. All we're doing is praying. It's going to be a little boring sometimes. Come on out, 6 o'clock to 6.45, and persevere in prayer with us. We're going to ask the Lord for his blessing on the church. And I think Pastor Paul will lead a couple of worship songs throughout that. But we're going to be seeking God together. Whoever comes will be there. If it's five of us, if it's 35 of us, we'll be there. Church, we're called to commit to the church. And that is part of how we will have a faith that lasts. And we have no better example than Jesus Christ himself in all of this. Because Jesus is committed to his church. He is so loyal to the church and to God's people that the Bible calls him the husband of the church who faithfully loved the church all the way to the cross. Jesus demonstrates for us how to submit to leadership by following the Father's plan to save us at the cross. His love for the church should motivate us. It's what won us into the family of God. Church, if Jesus shed his blood for this family we can surely endure some conflict together to find peace. And as we seek the Lord, we take heart knowing that Christ himself is interceding for us. He's praying for us that we would pull this off and have unity and love for one another. So to anyone here today who has a wound from here in the church, I urge you to look to the example of Christ. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. And if you yourself need that forgiveness, you've never experienced the forgiveness of God or been welcomed into the family of God, it's available to you today through Jesus Christ who went to the cross to pay for your sins and mine and rose from the dead to give us eternal life and then invites us in to this beautiful thing, messy thing, 
at times. Conflict-filled thing at times, but this beautiful thing called the family of God that we get to be a part of through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we ask that your goodness would fill us up. We pray that we would be like Christ and love the church well. Lord, we all confess that each of us is a sinner. And so each of us brings plenty of our own problems into this family here. So God, help us to be merciful with one another. Help us to work things out. When there is conflict, let us honor you and resolve it well. Help us to be quick to forgive, quick to humble ourselves, quick to apologize, quick to extend grace and mercy. Because God, that's what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Make us a family that is spurring one another on to love and good deeds. Let us be brothers and sisters in Christ the way you mean for it, because God, each of us has experienced, I think, some of that in the church. So let us be filled with that more and more as time goes on. And for anyone here today who needs the saving work of Jesus Christ, I pray that you would, that you would bring them to faith today. And if that's you, friend, if you say, I need Jesus in a new way, you can accept him through believing and trusting in his death and resurrection today. And I would love for you to come up and talk to me after today so I can uh, kind of walk you through that and celebrate with you. Lord, guard the work that's been done in your word and our hearing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, stand with me. I'm going to read a benediction over you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I invite you to hold your hands out on a posture of worship and reception. Receive this benediction. To this end, we always pray that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go walk in his grace and power this week, church. You're dismissed.